Hi everyone, I'm Steve Stoller. And I'm Shauna Haley, and this is Inside Plano, where we take you behind the scenes of our city. We'll introduce you to the faces and places who help make this a great place to live. And give us lots of reasons to love Plano. Welcome to September and another episode of Inside Plano, the city podcast. How are you doing, Steve Stoller? I'm doing great, Shauna. How are you? I am well. You know, we're doing this episode a little later this month because we've been super busy with budget season and overwhelming our listeners with added content from the budget. So we thought we'd take a little bit of a break and then come back with some non-budget stuff. Does that sound okay to you? Let's move. Let's get right into it. What's happening? Well, one thing that's happening is, as I said, it's September, and September is always a big month here in Plano because it is Hunger Action Month. And, you know, Steve, you and I have both lived in Plano for a really long time. <laughs> We're not going to talk about age. We're just going to talk about length of residency. Um, and one thing that I found to be a little bit of a surprise is how many people don't realize that there are significant numbers of individuals in our community who live with daily food insecurity. Um, but the good news is that all of us can help make a difference during the annual Collin County Peanut Butter Drive. It's hosted by the North Texas Food Bank. Our goal for 2022 is to collect a quarter of a million pounds of peanut butter or nut butter or a seed butter. And the drive continues all the way through the month of September. That is a lot of peanut butter, Shauna. Yes, but can, <laughs> that's just our share. <laughs> yes, people can participate in one of four ways. You can make an individual online donation and each dollar given equals one pound of peanut butter. You can donate donate 16 ounce plastic jars of any brand of peanut butter uh, or other nuts or seed butter to the North Texas Food Bank in Plano. The campus is located at 3677 Maple Shade Lane. You can form a team, you can band together and raise peanut butter funds as a group. It's a great option to create healthy competition between different groups or teams at work. Or you can join your company or organization's virtual peanut butter drive. Man, it seems to me like one of the best options is to, to donate. Um, I, I know that I cannot personally buy a pound of peanut butter for just $1. So definitely the food bank is able to take those dollars and really stretch them. Um, man, 250,000 pounds. That is a lot of peanut yeah. butter. But, you know, we always set the bar high and I don't think we've had a driver. We haven't hit our goal. So um, we want to keep that momentum going. Yeah. And I, I may be wrong. It's always risky to go completely off script, but I, I think that the goal for all of Collin County is a half a million pounds. So Plano's portion is 50% of the overall goal. And um, I think you're right. I don't think we've ever missed the mark on that. People in Plano always come through. That's right. That's right. And thanks to um, some very dedicated residents and um, very generous corporate partners that are headquartered right here in Plano. We're very thankful for our business community. But you know what? We're talking a little bit about money and um, it's a, you know, budget season has come to an end. In fact, um, city council just approved this month, the fiscal year 2022-2023 uh, budget and com community investment program. Uh, our special guest today, you'll hear her refer to SIP. Um, CIP is that community investment program. Our budget this year totals $677 million, and that community investment program includes $330 million worth of projects just through this next budget year. Uh, budget year for the city starts October 1, and you can always read all of the budget details all year long. They're on the city uh, website, and of course, uh, we'll have the link for that in the show notes for you. Speaking of city council, Shauna, did you know that scout groups or youth organizations play a big role in each city council meeting? These students help start our regular sessions by leading the Pledge of Allegiance and the Texas Pledge. You can sign up your troop or group for an upcoming meeting. Plano City Council meets the second, second and fourth Monday of each month at 7 p.m. And 
Finally, um, the communications team is responsible for sharing out information about a wide variety of things, including projects that are going on in the city. And there is something that I've noticed, Steve, over the last three months. We have shared a lot of information about parks and recreation projects that are getting started and wanting community feedback. That's why we've asked today's guest to join us, our park planning manager, Renee Jordan. Hi, Renee. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thank you for having me. We always like to start these interviews by asking our colleagues what it is about themselves that we may not know. And I'll tell you, we've got some real interesting responses. So what is it about Renee Jordan that we don't know? Okay. Well, um, I've been in Plano for a while. And so I wanted to tell you about uh, when I first moved to Plano, I was a kid. Um, so we moved to Plano shortly before the big winter storm of uh, December 83, January 84. And uh, we moved from St. Louis, Missouri. And when we were in St. Louis, my mom had my sister and I were in uh, skating lessons. And so we moved down to Texas, we brought our skates, there was nowhere to skate, um, except for the Galleria. And, uh, but what happened is we had this huge winter storm, uh, not only with really low temperatures, but we eventually had precipitation that really locked the city down. We had very thick ice on the streets and stuff. So my mom and sister and I all took our skates out and we skated down Silverstone Drive to Parker Road, uh, just west of Custer to see just how shut down the city was. And it was in fact completely shut down. And the ice was, um, you know, natural, like a little bumpy. We, we uh, when I lived in St. Louis, we had a pond that we could skate on in the neighborhood. Um, and, and of course an ice rink and it, uh, so anyway, that's my interesting thing. Skating on Plano streets. That's right. <laughs> well, Renee, that's tell, awesome. us, tell us a little bit about your role. What, what does a planning manager do for our parks department? Sure, so here in parks, um, it's, it's really um, my job, our, depart our division's job to implement uh, the city's park master plan and to implement our CIP program, uh, which is made up of the projects that are identified in bond initiatives that are really directed by the park master plan. And then really just my job is to support uh, all of our staff um, in park planning and outside of park planning that is tasked with implementing these efforts. So Renee, just for grins, I counted, <laughs> there are 29 active park and recreation projects underway right now and almost 10 um, additional projects beyond that that are maintenance or classified as median projects. Is your team always this busy? We are busy right now. Um, you know, we had a, a kind of a mini bond program in 2019. So we've got those projects from, from that project. And then we've got the uh, 21 program projects. And so, yeah, our team is very busy. We do have some folks outside of our actual team um, in the Parks Department at large that also work on implementing these projects too. So what are the biggest factors that are driving the types of parks and recreation projects that are coming online? Yeah, so one of the biggest factors is the need for renovation. Um, you know, one of the things that was identified in the 2018 Park Master Plan was that there's a real need to, to renovate parks. Um, a lot of the parks were developed um, around the same time frame and so are the same age. And those assets do age out and need replacement. Um, so for example, if you have a park that is about, that all the original parts are about 25 years old, 20 to 25 range, those parts do need replacement. So the playground, for example, um, the parts and pieces become obsolete um, just as they would um, on a car, for example, if you're trying to find parts for a, an old car. Um, my One of my employees likens it to, if you've bought a dining set and something like a chair breaks, it's really hard to replace a chair in a dining set that's 20 to 25 years old. So that necessitates replacement of essentially the whole play piece. Um, and then there are other assets in association with that. Um, if the park is 25 years old and the playground is 25 years old, it's likely that everything else in the park is 25 years old, like the irrigation system, all the components, the water fountain. Um, there might be a drainage system that's a part of that playground uh, play pit that may not be functioning optimally. So 
that's where it becomes a total park renovation. Renee, there's so many different things that are covered by park planning, everything from the facilities, neighborhood parks, to medians. How do you oversee such a wide array of projects? So we are really lucky in that we have, uh, we have a small staff, but we have some designated roles in that staff. Like for example, we have an urban forester who will oversee our median renovations. So he can specifically work on those um, in conjunction with our greater uh, parks department staff that specialize on irrigation. Uh, we have a trail system planner who can specialize um, on our trails, not only making new connections, but renovating the existing trails that might need it. Um, we've got two landscape architects on staff who can focus on um, our facilities that need renovation, like playgrounds or a, a classroom building, for example. And we've got a senior park planner, um, and she can work on some of our more unique uh, projects that we need to deliver. Um, trying to think of an example of one of those. Um, we recently had, for example, um, a beam crack in our Oak Point wooden pedestrian bit bridge. And so she oversaw this more unique project to get this beam replaced. Um, we've got a, um, a GIS technician who helps everyone um, get all the pieces that they need uh, for their plan sets. Um, and we've got a park compliance coordinator who helps us with our construction projects, making sure we comply with our erosion control ordinance. And of course, we've got an admin. So that's our little team, and that's kind of how we get everything done. We do have a couple of folks outside of the department who are, are, have a specialty in irrigation, and they work specifically on our park landscape and irrigation renovation projects or our public building landscape and irrigation renovation projects. What guides your team on how to decide what project should be addressed next? So um, we have a park master plan. And so in 2018, we undertook an initiative to update our park master plan. And so what our park master plan really identified as a significant need in there was to renovate aging parks uh, and to renovate uh, your recreation centers. And so, those things from our 2018 park master plan help inform the types of projects that we need to be looking out for in development of the 21 bond program, for example. And so um, that helped us uh, create a list um, with staff, with our park board, and that list was reviewed you know, with, um, we had an outside bond committee as well as our council and that list gets refined into what becomes the ultimate project list that goes out for consideration for the vote. And then really during our four-year program, it's our job to implement that CIP, pro that bond program. And so now we are actually in a position that our park master plan is almost five years old. It was passed in October, 2018. And so now we're launching an initiative to do an update to that park master plan so we can adopt the latest version uh, at some point in 2023. And going through that process, we will identify um, if there are any um, different or the same recommendations as the pre previous park master plan. And so when we kick that off soon, there will be a, um, a public participation project that will launch. There'll be a virtual engagement room. And we hope to have something about that in uh, the next month or so. Oh, that'll be really cool. You know, speaking of like cool things like that, we know that Plano is nearly built out. Like we've talked about that a lot um, with several of our other guests here on the podcast. But um, how is the Parks Department planning for maximizing our land? Like, are there other big park plans coming online that we don't know about, or maybe the average person doesn't know about? Sure, there there are. Um... So we have a park that um, is not developed with any improvements yet. It's called Los Rios Park. And so we have a first phase of that um, park development coming soon. It's going to be about a two mile trail connection that's going to connect from either side of Los Rios Park, picking up at the southern end of the Cottonwood Creek Greenbelt and the southern end of Bobble Drift Park. So it'll connect between those two with two miles of trail. So that will be the first um, phase of construction at that park and that will um, make that park accessible um, 
it doesn't have any improvements at this time. And so you can come into the park and use the green space, but this trail will really help um, at this time. And then um, another park that we have coming in the future is, um, it doesn't have an official name yet. We're just calling it the Collin Creek Mall Park Sites. Um, we have some land at Collin Creek Park, um, Collin Creek Mall that is going to connect um, Chisholm Trail to the north and south. So that will connect and we've got some land um, on the, I guess the 75 side and the Alma side of the future mall redevelopment that will be serve as parkland. And so there is a, a process right now that's underway to help develop the vision for that park. We recently just closed a really big, um, our first survey, uh, we just closed that. We got um, over 800 responses in that first survey. And now we are going through that survey information and we, in the next few weeks, we should release a second survey to kind of refine the ideas there. So those are a couple of big ones that I'm thinking about. Um, we do have a couple of other pieces of parkland, which the community experiences right now as farmland. Um, and that would be, um, one park would be called Hall Park and that is located at the corner of um, Alma and Park. And another one is called Moore Park, um, and that is located at the corner of Chaparral and Cloverhaven. And so for those two parks, we do not yet have funding to develop them. So if we wanted to develop them, we'd have to get them on to another bond initiative, like in 2025. Um, but we may be able to um, undertake a, a process um, in the next year or so to master plan for those two parks or to solicit ideas for what those two parks might be like to help um, inform a program and to develop a, um, a, a cost um, that we would shoot for and include that potentially in the 2025 bond program. It's kind of a snapshot of a few things going on. Yeah, and you were mentioning, so you said you did a survey for the Collin Creek Park sites and you, you might do those for, for the other two do you do surveys and things like that for all types of projects? I mean, how can the public get involved? I think like there's a, a, a park near where I live that's on the list of, of projects that are coming. So mm -hmm. if I was a person that wanted, like felt really passionate about what the parks department was going to do there, is there an opportunity for me to be engaged that way? Yes, absolutely. We, um, so whenever we have a park to renovate, um, we do um, a public engagement process um, that can take the form of one to two meetings or, or even three, it just kind of depends. Um, and we typically at the outset begin with an invitation to a meeting that is online. Um, we learned how to be a little more efficient through COVID. And so the format that it is generally in is a um, a presentation that is narrated. Um, it's very convenient because you can watch that presentation 24 seven and then you can take a survey. And then in order to generate interest in regards to that survey, we do a mail out um, to the surrounding neighborhoods. So for example, if it's a neighborhood park, um, which is typically bounded by um, six lane roadways on either side. So that's about one square mile. We do a mail out uh, like a postcard to all of those homes with a QR code that lets them know, hey, you can find this presentation and this survey, please take it. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And um, we also push that out on social media. So trying to get announcements out on Twitter, our social media stream, the city's social media stream, um, which would include Facebook, as well as Nextdoor to try to get as much interest as possible so we can hear from as many people as possible. And we also do put um, little um, signs in at the park site, kind of the corrugated plastic signs, so that if someone is walking by, they can scan that QR code and, and watch the, the presentation and take the survey from their phone even. So we try to get as much input as possible so we can try to incorporate the needs of the community in any renovation. Renee, we have a pretty cool project underway at Memorial Park. Can you talk a little bit about what's being done there? And I understand there's a new program that people will be able to participate in. Yes, um, so Memorial Park was just renovated um, and it was renovated so that it could host a Memorial Brick program. And the park is now um, open for use. 
And so at the park, there are brick pavers. Uh, they're four by eight brick pavers. And what we will be opening is a program in which a person can, uh, from Plano or uh, the area, they can honor a veteran or an active service person uh, by ordering a brick for, for them. That brick will feature their name, their rank, uh, their branch of service, and their years of service. And um, we will have a program to install these bricks in, a, in two batches per year. Um, we will have, um, in theory, one load will go in before Memorial Day and another load will go in before Veterans Day. We um, are still working on some of the technical aspects of the program um, right now. And so we're looking forward to that opening soon. Great. Was there any other projects you'd like to tell us about before we let you go? Um, we do have um, a project that is near Windhaven Meadows Park um, to the north of Spring, to the north of Windhaven Drive. And there is a piece of property there that is under development that um, we'll be putting in a trail connection as a part of their development um, that development is called um, the Outlook at Windhaven. And that is the first piece of a uh, section of trail that will span from Windhaven Parkway to Spring Creek Parkway. Um, and there's a future development there called the Almanac, um, which we're working with the developer on some parkland over there too. So that's pretty exciting in the future. Um, it would help make trail connections off Spring Creek Parkway and Windhaven down through Windhaven Meadows Park. So we're looking forward to that. Great, a lot of exciting things happening with parks. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Renee. We appreciate you joining us today and uh, letting our listeners know all the things that are happening with Parks and Recreation. So uh, Renee Jordan, our Park Planning Manager, thanks again. All right, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Well, that was a really great interview with Renee. I, as a runner, am so very excited about all those trail connections that she mentioned. That's going to be just really a wonderful way to get out and explore the area on foot. I nice love the Bricks Project, too. I mean, that's it's such a great way to honor people who have served and even people who were lost during times of war. So I, yeah. I love that project. I do too. I can't wait. I, I think she said that first installation, they're going to definitely be in before Memorial Day next year. That'll be really, yeah. really special. Well, you know, we keep saying it's September and I'm going to say it's September again, because that always means the Plano Balloon Festival, which is a huge annual event here in Plano. And um, I don't know about you, Steve, but there's something about seeing a hot air balloon in the air that has always just meant to me that I'm home here in Plano. And so it's just super fun to have the festival back. It's its 41st year. Um, and this year it's actually going to start on a Thursday. So September 22nd through the 25th, they start and have a special celebration concert with the Plano Symphony Orchestra. It's a, a landmark year for the orchestra as well. So they have a, a fun concert out there at Redtail Pavilion. Um, their very popular race series, a 1K, 5K, 10K, and half marathon, that's all back. Um, we've got all the details, including how you can get your tickets in the show notes. And one other important note before we go, we're looking for volunteer groups to participate in the Armstrong Park Love Where You Live Service Day on Saturday, September 24th. Groups will help with a wide variety of tasks needed by the residents of the neighborhood. They may include landscaping, painting, fence repair, litter cleanup, and more. Both individuals and groups are welcome to register, and we have the details in show notes. That's right. Well, that brings us to the end of another fun Inside Plano. And we thank you all for all of your feedback. I love getting your emails um, and, and your suggestions for future topics. You can send those to us at any time at askplano at plano.gov. Until then, if you'll leave us a rating or a review, it helps other people find our shows. And until then, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye, Plano. Bye, everybody. Thank you. And that's it for our Inside Plano. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did doing it. If you have any comments or suggestions, send them to us at askplano at plano.gov. Bye. Talk to you next month.
The Inside Plano podcast is brought to you by the City of Plano.